Yesterday sessions, I felt as if we are a really big family. It's a little bit smaller today, but uh, still, I feel that. Uh, hmm? Aha, uh -huh, yeah. Mm. Oh, so it's okay now? Yeah. I start again with Aloha. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. And uh, as I said before, I feel as if we are a really big family. We are uh, just a little bit smaller family today. Some people are perhaps doing other things. But uh, we will have uh, two hours together. And uh, this is uh, a lot of slides I'm going to present. So sometimes it's uh, rushing, and if you have any questions and uh, need some clarifications, please uh, let me know that, and uh, I can interrupt my presentation and we can go back. I'm very happy to be on Hawaii, and uh, this is uh, a dream for me to come to these islands. I think they are so, so far away from Sweden, uh, but uh, now we are here. Uh, I have been an architect uh, since 1962, so I am an old man. Uh, most of you have your fu future in front of you. Sometimes I say I have my future behind me, but uh, n now when I'm uh, on such a congress, uh, it's really, uh, I feel young again. Uh, this is uh, showing the place where we are living. We are living in Sweden, rather north of Sweden. It's uh, in the middle of Sweden, but uh, the, all the Swedes call it uh, in the northern part of Sweden. And we are living close to the Arctic Circle, and now we are in Hawaii. So it's a little bit far away. It's, uh, the time difference is 12 hours. So just now, it's uh, night. Uh, our office, we are working with sustainable projects and uh, inspired by nature. Uh, and this is uh, eco-cycle adapted projects, and I will explain a little bit more about wh what I think about eco-cycle design. We try to close the loops for the flows through the buildings and cities. We are uh, working with the low energy projects, and in a couple of years we will uh, have zero energy houses in, in Sweden. And we are also trying to get uh, zero waste. And uh, as architects, we are working very close to our clients. So most of the time when we start up a project, I move to the client's place in order to really feel that we are connected to the clients. And we also want to be in the project from the real beginning, starting with a clean white paper with the first ideas. And we also want to follow the project all the way to the maintenance phase. I think this is very, very important. And this is uh, to secure the, the whole project and the ideas in the project. Uh, most of our projects are educational projects. So we educate all those who are involved in the projects. And it means also we are training the worksmen out on the site before they start to work on the site. We are networking with other consultants in Sweden and all over the world. And of course, in close connection to the Siri network. And this is fascinating. I can drop an email to Günther and say, I have a problem. Uh, can you figure out if somebody in your network has been doing uh, handling these type of projects and within 24 hours I got an answer take contact with that man in Madagascar or <laughs> wherever and uh, then we are connected and we exchange ideas experiences uh, free and we can send documents to each other just to help each other to uh, make the projects much better and we are working with system design 
During my presentation, I go into uh, have three parts in my uh, presentation. The first, uh, I will try to explain why we need to act in another way in the future as designers, planners, and also for all of us. And the next part is uh, about uh, what we can learn from already realized uh, projects. And I stick to my own projects, for I uh, know them much better than others. And in the end of the presentation, how can we use eco-cycle design as a tool for designing buildings and cities? This is the three parts I'm going to present today. What is a sustainable project? Uh, there's many, many different uh, ways to explain it. But we uh, put out, first of all, it should be social sustainable. And social sustainability is, is very, very important. And all the projects we are discussing, we start also to, to describe the social vision for a project. I think this is very important, and we discussed it yesterday afternoon, that uh, it's not only technical, uh, technical uh, solutions we are discussing. We also need to discuss uh, social uh, inventions. Uh, a sustainable project should be also ecological sustainable, have a, uh, ecological sustainability. It means the less footprints for the project. And when we are talking about technical su sustainability, we are talking to the best available technology in the world. And this is very important. We, we, we need to upgrade all the projects uh, so we can find out is this the real best way to do it? And then the economical sustainability means that we are not only talking about investment cost, we are talk talking about the running cost and the life cycle cost. And the projects must be healthy. That's very, very important. And all sustainable projects must be adapted to the local nature, climate, culture, and uh, we can see that the projects are, they are a part of the nature. So starting with the first question, why? Reason why uh, reasons why we have to build sustainable. Yeah, there is the big, big problem in the world just now is the growth of the global population. Most of the politicians are focused on carbon dioxide and global warming. But what's threatened me is, uh, and scaring me is the growth of the global population. That's a problem that goes above everything. And I will show you the figures a little bit later. Also, the global poverty. We are living in a rich part of the world. And uh, you can see it all around you here. And we see it in Sweden. We are wealthy. But most of the people in all around the world, they live in poverty. And we have a lot of environmental problems, and I'm not going to, to uh, present all the problems we have in front of us. There is also a need of fresh water, and fresh water will be uh, the big problem in the future. Not fresh water for drinking, uh, fresh water for producing food. And another problem, uh, we discussed it yesterday, is wastewater treatment. The old way we are doing this, uh, can't, uh, it's not sustainable. We have to change the whole system. It's based on uh, a, an idea that the oceans and the uh, lakes uh, take care of everything. And if you don't see it, it's no problem. Star starvation, the need of food. Renewable energy. There's also a, a, a matter to think in another way. And also the building material. A lot of building material, are, they are not sustainable. If you have to see if it's possible to use local sustainable material. And when we start a project, we always look upon the old buildings. The, the buildings who have been standing there for hundreds of years, they tell us a story. 
uh, about what kind of material uh, this, they, uh, is sustainable on the, just this place. And also the communication in the future will need to, to be uh, solved in, in a different way. Uh, why am I interested in building more sustainable world? The first question, uh, the first answer I can give you uh, as a young uh, architect uh, and bird watcher, uh, I read Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, 1962. And I was so scared when I saw that they have the same problem in the United States as we have in Sweden. A lot of birds, the population of birds, had gone down in Sweden with 90% at that time, in the end of the 50s. And this really scared me. The second answer is, I have children and grandchildren. And I'm asking myself, what kind of word am I handing over to the next generation and next generations? Can I contribute to do it better? And that's the reason why I'm still working. I am retired since eight years, but uh, still working. And I feel that uh, I need a couple of years more. <laughs> and the third answer, the global population is growing too fast. This is very uh, good buildings in, in, in Manizales in Colombia. People living there, they are proud of that they have a house. There are a lot of other people, they have no, no homes, no houses. So when we look upon the, the, global, the growth of the global population, you can see on this uh, slide, uh, if we go a couple of thousand years uh, before our time, you can see that uh, the global population was about half a billion. You have billion of people on this. Uh, this way. Then it starts uh, 2,000 years ago to grow a little bit. But here we have the Bourbonic uh, plague in the middle of the 14th century. Half of the population in Europe died. At that time, we were about uh, 60 million people in, in Europe, and 30 million, million of people died. But as you can see, we recovered in Europe very fast. You can see it's like a bump down there, and then we have this curve. And uh, 10 years ago, we uh, reached uh, 6 billion people on the globe. 6 billion people on the globe. And uh, if you look just 100 years uh, uh, before today, uh, year 1900, this is uh, the year when my parents were born. At that time, we were 1.7 billion people on the globe. At that time, uh, 250 million people were living in cities. Then, 100 years later, we are above 6 billion, and half of the population is living in cities. Half of the population at that time were, were under 18 years of age. And if we go 50 years ahead from that figure, we will reach uh, a level of about 10 billion of people. And this is within 40 to 50 years. At that time, 75% of the population will live in cities. Seven and a half billion people. It means that we have to build houses for uh, four and a half billion people in, in a, a, a 40 to 50 years' time. It means about uh, homes for 300,000 people every day from now and to 2050. And uh, it's impossible to make the same infrastructure for these cities, for all these people. This is more than we have built in the history of man. And now we shall do it in 40 to 50 years' time.
Can you imagine what it means? Three days uh, growth of the population is the same population as in Hawaii. And we have to build cities for them. That's the reason why we also need new technology. And I'm so happy that we can work together with Gunther and the City Foundation and the Blue Economy and to try to figure out how can we handle this uh, challenge for the future. And we need all the effort that everybody can contribute to see if we can uh, redo uh, the whole situation. And, and another question, how can we mobilize the whole world in this challenge. Uh, I think this is uh, a, a political uh, problem. Yes, I'm out in the forest. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> good, yeah. Don't cut it down. We, we need all the trees. The, I, producing a lot of carbon dioxide, so. <laughs> and that's what, yeah, good. <laughs> So uh, everybody of us can play a vital role in this uh, challenge for the future. And I think this is so important that all of you can start today to do some small steps to a more sustainable world. To be a reliable consultant, it's important to live as you teach. When I come to a client and say, I think you shall make a sustainable project, and he asked me, how do you live? If I live in an old house with electric heating, with the uh, sewage connected to the, the local line, and uh, I driving an old-fashioned car, I think I'm not reliable. It's so important. So when Ingrid and I started our uh, own company 20 years ago, we said, we must live as we teach. So we live in an eco-cycle adapted village. Ingrid and I bought 18 hectares of land in 1966 and started to build our village in 1967. And the first summer we were living there was 1968. And now we are living there all year round. Oh, let's see. Uh, we are living here. That's the office. That's our home. That's our boathouse. This is our little sailing boat. This is the harbor for the whole village, and the village goes all the way up here in the forest and down here. And this was farmland uh, from the very beginning, and we have restored the farmland as it was in the middle of the 19th century. And then we have put all the buildings uh, in places which was not so attractive. And we have this... Uh, 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 possibilities to, to use all the land, land to, together. We have uh, uh, cattle during the summer, we have sheep, we, have, we can use the forest, we have a sawmill that we can take care of the, the, the timber and make lumber. So uh, we try to, to live together in the village. I will uh, tell you a little bit more about it then. So this is very important for me. And we live also in an eco-cycle adapted home. Here is the small house. We have made an extension to that. And you can see the office behind. And uh, the car is uh, fueled by ethanol. And the ethanol comes from the forest in Sweden. 85, E85. And this is the office uh, studio. It's an earth-covered house. So it's... Uh, the soil earth on three sides and also on the top of it. And we can grow uh, berry bushes on the top of the building. Uh, we uh, have this green, ro green room uh, in front of the building uh, facing south. So we can uh, produce uh, vegetables almost the whole year. That's only December, January and February. It's a little bit too dark in Sweden. And I will tell you a little bit more about this later on. And we are producing a lot of food ourselves. Uh, and this is fascinating, to live close to the countryside and you have the richness that you can use the soil and produce food. And we are living close to the ocean and we can fish there. 
and I'm tra training my grandchildren to be fisher, fishermen. And I was so happy when I got this uh, map. Uh, it was included in the package I got when I uh, registered. And now I know much, much better when I shall be uh, farming and when I shall fi be fishing. So I will bring it home and see if we are more successful uh, when I come home. So this is old knowledge. I think very important, very important to, uh, to take care of the old knowledge. And during the summers, the short summers in Sweden, we are sailing. I can mention that the ocean outside the place where we are living, it's frozen uh, uh, six months per year. So uh, the ice breaks up uh, from the middle of April to the middle of May. Then you can imagine that it's a short summer. What is eco-cycle design? Eco-cycle design is a holistic way to design buildings and cities. Holistic. We take in, uh, in the calculation everything that is in, in, inside the, the, the planning situation. It uh, combines beautiful design with system designs. Most of the architects nowadays, they are designers. They made beautiful buildings. But sometimes I'm thinking, they have new, uh, no knowledge about the system design. I think this is so important. And I will tell you a little bit more about it later on. We have improved this method for many, many years now. And uh, together with my daughter, we have made some uh, specifications that are available. And you can see some of them on our homepage. Uh, we can use it both for old buildings and new buildings. And uh, it includes cost efficiency, sustainability, energy saving, recyclable material, high quality, good indoor environment and health. And we have done it. And it works. We know that it works. We are not just talking. So if we look at the cities of today, are they sustainable? Do you think? Can you see what, which city this is? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, a part of Los Angeles. That's a small part of Los Angeles, yeah. Uh, I think it's uh, perhaps a little bit difficult to make this uh, city eco-cycle adapted, but I think that if they want to convert a city to, uh, to an eco-cycle uh, city, it's possible if they really want. They have all the resources. The only thing is you need to rethink. So the cities of tomorrow must be sustainable. When we are planning new cities, they must be sustainable. I think the eco cycle, uh, infra the infrastructure must be eco cycle adapted. We must close the loops, less energy, less water consum consumption, it's possible. We must offer fresh air, local healthy materials, no waste. We must also have a higher degree of self-sufficiency. And nowadays, there is a movement in the United States with city farming. This is very, very interesting. 15% of the food in the world is produced in the cities. And this is a possibility to continue to do that to produce the food close to the places where uh, people are living. And this can also be a part of the solutions for the buildings. And naturally, uh, the, we must also have energy sufficient transportation. But the big question is, how can we change the old cities? And uh, I think we, during this week, we'll hear about uh, the, the project in Canary Island, and they are trying to change uh, a whole island to be more sustainable. I think this is very, very interesting, and we need good examples from that. So for me, is the perfect city is an ant hill. They are built of local materials, perfect ventilation, perfect humidity, Perfect temperature, 
low need of energy, good roads, organic food, no waste, well organized, there's a queen in the top or down below, <laughs> uh, built on a social vision and it's eco-cycle adapted. We can learn from this. So this is a slide from Mauritania and I think uh, that's very little water coming out of, of uh, uh, this pipe. In Mauritania, uh, the average rainfall is less than three, per, three millimeters per year. Three millimeters per year. And uh, the fresh water will run out within 10 years. And then you need to discuss how can we handle the need of fresh water, the food, communication, energy, building material, waste, waste handling. And the big uh, uh, possibility is to educate the young generation, to give them a view of what can be possible to do. And I'm so happy to hear that on Thursday we will meet a lot of young people from Hawaii. And I think this is a must to educate the young generation. And so they can get an idea that clean tech solutions and eco-cycle design can be tools for planning the new cities in the future. This is an idea uh, to illustrate a self-sufficient eco-cycle adapted city with 40,000 inhabitants in the northern part of Europe. The land requirements is about 100 square meters per person. And uh, it means that we need uh, land for 10 by 10 kilometers to make the city self-sufficient with everything what the city needs. We can make a city uh, in one or two stories, buildings. Uh, let's see. Uh, and uh, the city is just two and a half kilometers by two and a half kilometers. And everything is in walking distance. And it's possible to reach the city center within uh, a couple of minutes' time. And then you can connect this city to a bus or train and light rail uh, communication and go to another city like this. So this is a possibility. Uh, and in your climate, the area for production, for the food production and the recycling and all these things is sm much, much smaller. So this is the living area. This, this is just a scheme. There's not a, a plan, not, not a, f a, a detailed plan. It's just an illustration of the need of land. So it takes you uh, five minutes. If you are living here, it takes you five minutes to the city center with a bike. And uh, then schools and uh, all kinds of premises uh, can be uh, uh, in the middle of the city. And uh, close to the place you have the farmland and, uh, that can produce the food for everybody. And this is uh, an idea of how such a city can look like with small plots. In this case it's 15 by 15 meters. And uh, when I presented this idea in Japan, they say that the plots were too big. <laughs> but it's possible to build uh, one family house, and we have also checked that it's uh, possible to take care of the wastewater, and you can also produce a little of your need of food on your own plot. We have tried and we have test this, uh, tested this in uh, Tanzania, in Bagamoyo, and also we have uh, tested it in Marandoa in Colombia. No, not Marandoa. You? Marandoa, yeah. So this is my folding bike. This is the communication possibility for the future. Uh, there's a lightweight. It uh, only weights eight kilos. Uh, I can, it's uh, three years. Uh, I can fold it. I can bring it in a car. It's a rubber band instead of a chain with grease. I have brought it all over the world. It's in India, in the Himalayas, in 
in uh, uh, rainforests and everywhere. And uh, I can use it very easy. And it's a good example. Nowadays, there are many, many more examples of that. But if you have such a bike living in a dense uh, city, then you can bike to the bus, f uh, fold the bike, go with the bus, unfold it, and then you're biking to your shop or to your office or whatever. Yeah, the next part of my presentation is what can uh, we learn from realized projects? And uh, I will start with uh, the oldest project uh, in, in my production. That's uh, our own village outside Sundsvall, 30 kilometers from the city, uh, close to the coastline, close to the ocean. And this is based on a social vision. And that, this was the first time Ingrid and I wrote down a vision of the life in the village. We made it on a piece of paper, and we said, this time we shall not uh, make any changes of the idea. And this is very important that we could see uh, a, a real picture of what we wanted to do. So we started to, to make the plans and in, uh, in good cooperation with the municipality. And uh, we have our own water supply. We have small scale waste water treatment. It's built of local material. It's mostly wood. We use uh, renewable energy close to the village. There's a windmill, and uh, some of the houses has uh, 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 heating their, their water by the sun. We uh, use, as I mentioned, renewable energy, and uh, the, this is a cheap way of living. I have designed all the houses in the village uh, together with the families. So they are uh, similar, but they are specially designed for every family's need. And this is some slides from the village. We work together. This is uh, the portable chainsaw. This summer we have been uh, taking down a lot of trees and we are going to uh, build a house uh, for the village. We have, uh, for sure, a lot of parties, very important, the social life in the village. And we are training the kids in the village. And uh, my own uh, grandchildren, we are training they, them to be survivors. I think this is very important to know that they are able to fish, to uh, farm, to take care of the fish and uh, to take care of the vegetables. And they can use uh, uh, tools for, uh, for a lot of things. I think this is so important. And we have uh, a local administration for the, for the village. So this is the harbor in the Rumpan village. And we have, uh, this is the meeting place for, for, for all those who are living in the village. Uh, Earlier, we have the meeting places in cities and villages. It was in front of the church, uh, church or at the crossroad in a village. But nowadays, we are sitting in cars and not so many going to the church. So I think it's important when you are deciding about a project to find out a place, a, a natural meeting place. And we have also a sauna here. And... Uh, this is also a place where I have my meetings for the company. And this is how it looks like in the middle of the winter. In the middle of the winter, we have four hours of daylight. So, but it's still rather beautiful when it's cold. This last winter was very cold. We have one and a half meter of snow. And it was uh, for one month minus 20 centigrades. Close to our place, we have an earth cellar. It's an old traditional way to keeping the food uh, during the summer and the winter. And it, not, it, it doesn't need any energy. 
And the, the water distribution in the village comes from this house. We have drilled a hole down and we are pumping up the water. But half of this building is also a room where we can uh, put used goods. And this is free for everybody in the village to, to uh, go there, pick up an old bike or spare parts from a grass cutter or whatever. So we put all these things in this room and then it's free for everybody to bring it. We are throwing away so many, many really good things that can be used for many, many years. And uh, when uh, my grandchildren coming to our place, we need a lot of bikes, I will say. Uh, we need at least 10 bikes <laughs> and then a lot of friends. So that's uh, important to use the old bikes. And this is our boathouse. Uh, this is uh, the best place for me to stay here. We are usually having dinner, Ingrid and I, on this balcony. And my sailing boat can go into this, uh, uh, close to this boathouse. And uh, we can be there from end of April to beginning of October. And when you are visiting us, I invite you all. Can I do that, Ingrid? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so uh, when you are passing by my place, please uh, give me a call and then we can have dinner on the balcony. Uh, and this is when Günther visited us first time together with his two sons. And uh, this is also something that fascinates me, firewood. Firewood wood is what I call stored uh, stored sun energy. One piece is one kilowatt hour. And we use it for heating the home. It's not so well insulated. It was built 1967. But this little uh, wood stove gives enough of energy. And we have a heat exchanger. So the warm air goes up to the ceiling. And then we have a fan taking down the uh, warm air and heat it up along the chimney and then we blew it into the other rooms and we have holes in the uh, floor so we can recycle uh, the warm air for the building. So also in the real cold winter we are during daytime self-sufficient with energy. We have a greenhouse and we are <coughs> uh, using fresh grass cut uh, and put it on sand. We are not using ordinary soil for, uh, for the vegetables. We grow it in sand and with fresh grass cut. And it means that uh, we need less water, there is no weeds, and it's growing very, very fast. And this is the separating toilet uh, in our home. Uh, it's a modern uh, one, so the urine goes down in the front and the feces go down in a bucket, and we change it uh, once a month to the, to the compost. Uh -huh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the wooden separating toilet uh, I have designed uh, for my office. And uh, this is uh, possible to, to, to make whatever you have some wooden materials. And uh, the urine goes down in the front and in the back, the feces. And then we have a stainless steel bucket here uh, that collects uh, the feces. And uh, there's no smelling. And the reason why I emphasize on, on the separating toilets is that in feces, there's a lot of bacteria and viruses. And the nutrients in the feces is just 15%. 85% is in the urine. And the urine is uh, free from bacteria and viruses. So if we can collect the urine and uh, 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 put 10 parts of water and one part of urine together, then we have a fertilizer, a very good fertilizer. And the feces can be composted locally. And uh, after one year, there is no bacteria and viruses. So this is... Uh, a way to do it uh, out at the, at the countryside in all over the world. So I made a uh, drawing and specification how you can do that, and I distribute this free to everybody who, who wants to have this design. And this is uh, how it's working. 
uh, the dry separating toilet, the feces go down to the bucket, and then we put this uh, feces down to compost, and we're using uh, uh, earthworms as a part of the handling of the feces, and then we can use it for, for, uh, as a fertilizer. The urine goes down in a urine tank, and we pump it up uh, once a year, uh, and we use it for uh, irrigation and fertilizing uh, in the garden. The gray water goes down in a separate pipe to a septic tank, three chamber septic tank. We take care of the sludge and that also go to the compost. And then the, uh, the water goes down to an infiltration in a sand filter. And then in the end we have uh, clean water. And this is fresh water, we have checked it. It's, uh, it's possible to use it for drinking water. It's so clean. It's very simple, no pumps, nothing. And this is how uh, you can do it in a one family house. If you, the incoming water coming this way, then the, uh, uh, the, uh, the gray water goes down here and uh, in a separate uh, pipe, the urine goes down to the urine tank and there is a connection in between them. If this will be filled up, then it goes into the gray water system. And then you need about, in Sweden, six meters of infiltration. Uh, and this is possible to do on a plot. And this is an easy way to treat the gray water. And you can reuse it for irrigation and whatever. So this is my compost, it's three chambers, and uh, it's, we, we use it one year and then we change it to the other one. And here's the septic tank, and this is the urine tank close to the building. And in Minisales in Colombia, we, uh, for, for a project there, Günther is involved in it, and uh, we made this toilet in Sweden, send it. There's the, the most expensive toilet in the world. <laughs> the, the cost for transport was, ah, ah don't remind me. <laughs> uh, but uh, this was an example. So, so it was possible for the local people to make it by local material. And they have started to do that. And I think it's about 60 or 70 toilets now in the village. And it's working. And... Uh, this is a, a very simple way. Now we are also introducing this technology in other countries. So the, there you can see the ventilation from the toilet, and on top of this, it's a, a photovoltaic-powered uh, fan uh, helping the air going up. But you can also paint the chimney black and use the uh, heating from, from the hot air to uh, take away the... the the uh, air from it. Yeah. And this is the first uh, separating toilets uh, on the way in Bhutan. Uh, this is in Ura in Bhutan, where we were uh, in, in, uh, in March this year. <coughs> and I uh, in, introduced this uh, way of uh, making toilets. They were a little bit... Uh, hmm, uh, uh, scared about uh, what I'm talking about, but they, they understood about the uh, bacteria and viruses. And the same day, the, uh, the people in the village, starting the carpenters, very skillful, started to make the first separating toilet in, in Bhutan. And now we have also sent the, uh, the toilet uh, uh, in, insets for, for the separation of urine and feces to, to to Bhutan. So, next example. This is our own EcoCycle Adapted Office. It was built 91 to 93. I built everything myself. And it's, <coughs> as I mentioned, an earth and soil covered house uh, with a greenhouse and the termite ventilation. I will explain it a little bit better later on. We have separating toilet. We have sun collectors on top of the building, local building material, and we have also uh, p possibilities to, to get the light into the building by uh, 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 
windows in, 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 in the roof. Low need of energy, we need only 6,000 kilowatt hours per year, and we buy it from a windmill nearby. We can recycle all water. We have low monthly cost. It's about uh, less than $300 per month, including everything. It's 125 square meters, 1,250 square feet. So it's a cheap way of living in such a house. And we use passive and active solar energy. This is the office. All the staff is gone. They are perhaps in Hawaii. <laughs> and the greenhouse uh, facing south. And my mother's, my old mother's, or my mother's old <laughs> lamp in the middle of, of the greenhouse. Beautiful in, in the dark nights in, in fall. And we can grow sweet grapes. And still we are living close to the Arctic Circle, and we can uh, harvest the grapes uh, at midsummer, three months before Italy. This is the sun collectors, and it's connected to an uh, uh, accumulator. And also the, the wood stove is connected to, to, the, uh, to the accumulator. And this is uh, the sun collectors on the roof. And we are also trying to uh, test new products and new technologies in the village before we use it in our project. This is an example of where we tried uh, lightweight concrete. It's a beautiful material and it's easy to, to produce. And it's uh, very sustainable, good insulation, and uh, it's easy to do that. We also use, uh, we tried the different kind of cellulose insulation, beautiful insulation made from wood. And uh, it's not burning, it's uh, uh, safe for, for uh, uh, mold uh, and fungus. And uh, you can reuse the insulation later on. It's a beautiful material. We are no, uh, not using plastic in the walls. So this material can adapt and take up the humidity, but you can also leave it later on. And this is heat-treated wooden roofs. The next example is the Lagerberg School in Timro. Uh, it was built 19, no, 95. <laughs> yeah, 95. It's an old school from the 30s. Uh, and we have added a new building to that. And the municipality wanted to see if it's possible to uh, renew, retrofit an old building and make it eco-cycled adapted. And uh, then they wanted this extension. So this is uh, one of the most eco-cycle adapted schools in Sweden. With closed loops, the flows of energy, water, air and material. Uh, we have termite ventilation. We have separating uh, toilets. In this case, we have water flushing, separating toilets. There's composts for, for the feces and also for vegetables that are used in the kitchen. We are using renewable energy, and this is uh, wood pellets, and it's stored in this tower. And in the bottom of that, we store the ash and the ash goes back to, to the forest as a fertilizer. We are using only healthy materials, and we are recycling all the waste. The, the uh, children take care of all the waste. They are sorting it in 15 different matters, and uh, they know uh, how to handle it, uh, everything. So the whole school is a part of the education, and this is very important. They know uh, that they live uh, are, uh, in, a, in a green school. They know the, the uh, systems and the materials and the reason why it's built in that way. And some of the parents have moved to, the, to, to this municipality so their children, their children can go into that school. This is some of the uh, illustrations I used to uh, discuss the system design for a building. This is the energy system. 
So as you can see, that's the tower for the wood pellets. And uh, it's a stoker taking it down to the pellets boiler. And the ash goes out, and then it goes back to the forest. And we have uh, solar energy from to sand collectors. And uh, uh, we have this air supply with this uh, termite ventilation going down in, from a tower down in the, uh, in the ground and into the building. And this is the way how we preheat the air, incoming air in winter and how we can cool it in the summer. And it's amazing that uh, uh, the teachers told me a couple of years ago that uh, in, sometimes in the summer it's too cold in the building. In Sweden, in a wooden building. And this is really something different. This is the greenhouse and, uh, where they're growing fresh vegetables. And uh, you can also see the uh, skylights. And this is for the natural ventilation. We have no fans. It's only natural ventilation. And this is termite ventilation. Uh, the, the home for, for the termites is built up like this. And this is a sun collector. So if the fresh air outs us is plus 30 centigrades, this can be up to 50 centigrades. So it speeds up the incoming air. It goes down in the soil and goes up like this. And by the pressure of the uh, hot air and the, the cooler air. So they have constant temperature and humidity in the pile. And this can be used also for buildings. So this is how we had done it for the school. Uh, this is the supply air inlet. And uh, this is the way in. There we have a filter. We have possibilities to preheat it in the winter. There is a fan pushing the air down to the basement. And then the air inlet to the classrooms goes through small benches. And uh, the cold and heavy air goes along the uh, floor, uh, the heated up by the children. And then it goes up by natural ventilation. And the interesting thing is that this roof is uh, a part of the ventilation system. There's an air space between the metal sheets on the top, uh, on the roof. So the air goes close up here and are very, very hot, goes up in between the windows and are connected to the natural ventilation. So it speeds up uh, the, uh, uh, the, the ventilation, the used air. And this is the first time we have used uh, uh, tropical plants as a part of the uh, ventilation system. I come back to that later on. There you can see the air intake. And uh, the chimneys, they are for the natural ventilation. And this is the uh, fresh air intake in the classrooms. It's very easy to... to uh, change the amount of air. This is the wastewater treatment in the Lagerberg school. We uh, have these uh, separating toilets and we have the compost in the basement. And uh, the flushing water uh, goes down uh, and are separated in a vortex and goes down to the gray water treatment. And the urine goes down separately to a tank outside the building and they use this urine for fertilizing the golf course in the municipality. They mix it uh, uh, with 10 parts of water. So this is the separating toilet in the wall hand porcelain toilet. There is the urine uh, and here is the feces and the water flushing. And for the small children, so they not, will be composted uh, there's a special seat. And you can also see the tropical plants that we are using for, for the ventilation. And this is uh, the vortex equipment that are separating the feces, the paper, and uh, uh, the flushing water. And the flushing water uh, leaves in that direction, and then the compost is here. And they, uh, only once a year, they uh, have to, to uh, 
go down and take away the compost material. And also in the old school, it's possible to do the same. So this is the air intake, and we are uh, uh, individual supply of air to every room. And here we also use a fan for the, for the ventilation, so we can force it. And then we take care of the, we have a heat collector, and they preheat the incoming air in the winter. So it's possible also in an old building to convert it to this uh, uh, termite ventilation. This is one of the main projects. It's 10 years since it was ready. This is Green Zone. It's a project up in far north of uh, Sweden. It's a, a car dealer shop. It's a McDonald's. <laughs> and it's a petrol station. There's buildings for, uh, for uh, cars and people who are moving around. And uh, the man who is uh, the client, he has uh, introduced the ethanol cars in Sweden. 15 years ago, and I met him on a conference, and I didn't know about him. Uh, he, he, there was a, a special conference talking about the future, and I was presenting ideas around uh, the way we can build in the future, and he was uh, presenting uh, the, the new concept for ethanol cars and other concepts too. And we were eating lunch together, and I and he told me that he was going to build these uh, buildings in, in Umeå, north of Sweden. And uh, he said that uh, I have an architect and uh, we have a consultant team. And uh, can you please uh, help me uh, the last months uh, to check if we are doing the, the drawings and the specification in the right way? And I, I didn't know him, so I said, uh, you are as all clients. Uh, you need to do a green building. Oh, we must be green. And then you put a sun collector or a separating toilet, and then you called it, this is a green building, and I'm not working in that way. And he said, uh, how do you want to do? And I said, uh, I want to start with a white paper, and we start to discuss uh, the system design from the very beginning. And I didn't hear about him, and then, a couple of months later, he called me and said, I want to talk to you. And uh, I went back with an ethanol car, and I was appointed uh, uh, architect and designer for the whole concept. So this is, sometimes you meet clients that have a vision, and they want to do that. And this is one, still, still one of the most eco-cycle adapted pro projects in the world. So in this, uh, the uh, plot, you can see we have taken care of the, the storm water. We can pump it up here, and it goes down all around the plot. Uh, we uh, have uh, no connection to the district heating. We are self-sufficient with the energy. Uh, the energy comes from, from uh, McDonald's kitchen. This is the only McDonald's in the world. There are 25,000 restaurants in the world for McDonald's. And this is the only one where we take care of the energy from the kitchen. And we also take care of all the uh, energy from uh, the petrol station. And we use it in that building to heat it up. And we can uh, uh, heat up 45,000 square feet more buildings if we have more buildings that need energy from the waste energy from the kitchen and from the petrol station. So this is how it looks like. The, this is the little lake uh, where we are taking care of the storm water. You can see there's green roofs. And the idea behind this, this is giving us a little bit better uh, insulation. It takes care of about 50% uh, of the storm water. And when the storm water evaporates from the roof, uh, we are cooling down the outdoor temperature in the summer. Uh, and it's uh, easy to maintain. You don't need to do anything within 70 years. And on the top uh, of the building, you can see also, also the skylights, lanterns. And this is the only new invention we have presented in the project. All the other things is well known, but we have put it together in systems. 
So there, this is a new type of, uh, of uh, skylights. And uh, uh, we are using Fresnel lenses taking care of the daylight, not only the sun, energy sunlight. So also a cloudy day, it's possible to give a very good indoor light in the building. I can show you on some of the slides. We have wind powered fans on top of the building. We have termite ventilation. We have solar collectors. This is a solar collector built of ordinary building materials facing, the, facing south. And it gives us enough of energy uh, most, uh, mostly during uh, the winter, the fall, winter, and spring. And as I mentioned, the stormwater harvesting, and we are uh, cleaning uh, the stormwater by using special plants. And this is the daylight cupola with the Fresnel lenses, taking care of the daylight, bring it down into the building. And in the, the, uh, uh, the car dealer shop, where we have six meters in, in, uh, up to the ceiling, it's uh, still 600 uh, lux uh, where they are repairing the cars. This is the air intake and also the, the solar collector built of building material. We have the green rows for the storm water, and the, as I mentioned earlier. And it's possible also to irrigate uh, these roofs with the gray water from the house. This is the inside of the car dealer shop. And here you can see the, the uh, uh, living filters. The air comes in like this and along the plants and we blow it down here. And the, the plant takes care of the carbon dioxide and produces oxygen. And we are spraying water on these plants every 30 minutes. And it means that all the dust in, in the air are, uh, it, it's collected uh, on, on the leaves. And then when they flush next time, uh, the, uh, the uh, dust goes down in the soil and it's contaminated there. So this is a good idea in uh, places where you have bad outdoor air. The biggest uh, fil living filter in Sweden is on, uh, on the nearby airport where we are living. So it's uh, self-sufficient with energy, no connection to sewer line, and uh, tropical plants, as I mentioned, daylight and the electric energy from a windmill. This is streaming water and pumps uh, cleaning the storm water. And we have uh, uh, information signs all over the building. So people who are visiting the building, also when they are sitting on the toilet, they have an information about the toilets. <laughs> Uh, and everywhere about the, the painting and the material and the way of thinking. So this is very important that you can give people visiting uh, the uh, building. And we have trained all the people here, also the uh, board of directors, the consultant team, the entrepreneurs, uh, and uh, also the people working on the site, and also the people uh, who are working in McDonald's and all the places here. They are trained so they know uh, what, what's, uh, how it works in, in the building. This is an illustration about the building material and the construction. It's a wooden construction above a prefabricated concrete uh, foundation. And you can see the sedum tiled roof. Uh, the daylight lanterns, and we have cellulose insulation in the building. And this is the climate control system. Uh, we are connected to a windmill, and we have uh, uh, a heat pump technology for cooling the building and for preheating the, the building. And we are uh, using in floor heating. We have this uh, sun collector on the south and facade, and uh, the wood fiber board in the ceiling is a part of the construction. It also insulates uh, uh, the building, and it's a part of the cooling system. 
very interesting that you can use the uh, same material uh, for many, many different reasons. And this is the ventilation system. We are using these uh, uh, tropical plants. The air goes around like this. Also in the, the uh, place where they are maintaining the cars. And this is the sources of energy. So in the middle of the plot, we have uh, the, the uh, drilled hole where we take the, the ground heating. Uh, and uh, we are producing the heat to the buildings, but also use it for cooling down uh, the air in the petrol station and in McDonald's. And then the surplus energy is used uh, for the, all the buildings. So and we are reusing, as I mentioned, the surface water. Uh, there's the evaporation for, from the storm water on the sedum roof. And half of the uh, rain water go down to this uh, water garden, as we call it. And then we pump it up to the small streams. And we reuse it for the toilets and also for the car wash. So the water and sewage system in this uh, building is, uh, we, we are buying the fresh water from the municipality uh, line, and it goes to the kitchen and to the uh, pantries and so on. But we reuse a lot of water for the car wash, for the reconditioning of the cars, and for flushing the toilets. And we collect uh, the oil, the grease from, from the car wash and from the workshops, and this uh, goes to for destruction. And we are also taking care of the, in the fat separator from the kitchen. And we then have these three compartment septic tank and ground infiltration, and then we can reuse the water. So uh, this is interesting that it's possible to do it in a commercial building. The electric installation, yeah, as I mentioned, the windmill, Daylight from uh, lantern lights. We have on-demand plasma light, balanced incoming daylight. Uh, we have green cables. We uh, have lighting governed by motion detectors. And this is uh, in, in, in the workshop. You can also see here the, uh, the tropical plants. The air go in here and we distribute it close to the, to the floor. And here you can see the skylights. And at the same time, we go down to 10% for the electric lights when we have enough of light from, from the sky. Also in the McDonald's uh, 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 restaurant, we have this uh, uh, plants. It's fascinating to see the people coming into the restaurant and they are sitting close to that and then st st it starts flushing uh, the plants. <laughs> They're really scared and just wonder what's happening. <laughs> so what we have we achieved in this project? We can reuse and recycle all materials. We have make a database for all materials. We can uh, uh, the reduction of electricity is 60%. Re reduction of external input energy for heating, 75%. We have a total reduction of cooling. Uh, the take care, we have a renewable energy. We take care of all surface water. We have reduced the fresh water need with 90% in comparison with the similar buildings. And we can use the, the nutrient substances in the toilets for, for as a fertilizer. So what we learned from this project, it's very important to have an active client. Very, very important. We have a detailed program, no compromises. We have a project management from the first idea all the way through the whole building. We have very creative consultant team and contractors. We had a good relation to the municipality of Umeå. Uh, we had the possibility to educate all of the people involved in the project. And nowadays, we have a very proud and competent staff. They, they are the best forge sellers in Sweden.
nowadays. This is a block of flat in Umeå. It's a condominium with 32 apartments. And in the middle of the house, it's a green room. So uh, all the entrances to the apartments is from a balcony, and they have also a bigger balcony to the green room. So this is a built of a social vision that this area, this room in the middle, is uh, the meeting place for the people living in the building. And uh, we have no uh, connection to district heating and no uh, connection to sewer line, and it's built of glue laminated timber. This is how it looked like from the top of the building. You can see the glue laminated floors with the uh, uh, indoor balconies. And now we are uh, learned from this project, and now we are discussing a lot of new projects uh, in Sweden based on this uh, uh, experience we got. And it's based on a social vision, an ecological vision, technical and economic vision. And uh, uh, this is uh, how it can look like, the building with the balconies and the green room in the middle. And now we are discussing a lot of similar projects. Here is close to the place where we are living, close to a river with a green room uh, in the middle of the building like this. And there is a section of that building. And we are also discussing a bigger project uh, in the northern part of Sweden with three houses or, uh, upon a very uh, beautiful place where you can watch the, the, the ocean and the islands outside. And this is the first time we are introducing split box, and I will tell you more about that. This is the section for that building. This is one of the first uh, really eco-cycle uh, adapted uh, one-family houses. Uh, it's uh, sustainable material with low or no emissions. It's well insulated with cellulose insulation. It's a wooden structure. Uh, we have a prefabricated foundation made of glass, as we were talking about yesterday. I will surely show you a little bit more about that. The Collian technology. We have termite ventilation. It's working very well in the winter and in the summer. Uh, the need of energy for heating only two weeks per year in the northern part of Sweden. And this is the first split box installation. Uh, and we have no connection to the sewer line. This is the Collion technology. This is the foundation for the building. So uh, it's foam glass, and it's put together in elements, uh, prefabricated elements. Uh, it's based on reused glass. Uh, 75 to 80 percent of the glass is uh, reused, and 20 to 25 is new glass. Uh, and then they put uh, carbon dioxide into the material, and it will be small bubbles in it. And it's a very, very good insulation material and it, uh, it can't take up uh, 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 any humidity. It's, uh, it's the ants and the termites can't, can't go into the building. And we can use it both for foundation, walls, and roofs. It's fire protected, so we can build fire protected houses with this technology. And we have tried to introduce it in California. Uh, yeah, protected from moisture. Uh, you know that uh, uh, the plastic foundation with the styro styrofoam, is it the name? Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, the, the ants love it. They eat it. So uh, if you have insulated your house with the styrofoam, uh, they, you have a home for ants for many years. And this can, material can be used in cool climate and also in hot and humid climate. And they can be reused when you take down the building. This building material can be reused in a new building again. You can just take a part of it. It takes four hours to build the foundations for a one family house. And we have also designed uh, the fire protected buildings with this technology. So it's possible to do that. 
and now the split box technology. And uh, we have done a couple of houses in Sweden with this technology. And uh, this is fascinating. And there is a need of more money to, to get the, uh, this company to, to spread their ideas all over the world. There is a need for that. So in uh, this case, we connect. Yeah, first of all, we have this termite ventilation in the building. And then uh, all the uh, installations that need water uh, is connected with the split box. And we are also using the uh, gutters uh, as a part of the ventilation. Uh, it means that we can take care of the, the used air. And uh, with the heat pump technology, we can take the energy from the air, from the humidity in the air, and from the flushing water. And we can reuse this energy and, uh, in an accumulator and use it for uh, heating the water and heating the house. Uh, so uh, we, everything goes down in the split box. And in the end, we get cleaned water that can be used for uh, irrigation, for producing food and whatever. You can also use it for flushing the toilet. Uh, you get a fertilizer that you can use. And the interesting thing is that uh, uh, they separate the feces and the paper, <coughs> and uh, it will be separated and dried. And the urine goes down in, uh, uh, in a special filter, and the, all the chemicals will be taken out of the flushing water. Uh, and it's an ordinary water flushing toilet, so it's no special things. Then we take also we can the kitchen waste uh, can also the biological kitchen waste go also down to the split box, and then we dry all these things in vacuum and let the, when we let up the vacuum the temperature goes up to 70 to 80 centigrades and then all the bacteria and viruses will die, so we have a dry powder and clean water. And if you don't need, want to use it as fertilizer, you can burn it and use it as energy. This is the Daiwa House office in Sendai in Japan. I, my contribution is the ventilation system. And uh, they have termite ventilation. And uh, they have now been running for four years. And it works very well. They have, this is uh, during the summer. They're taking in the air and they distribute it in the building. Use the roof, uh, the black roof, uh, as a sun collector, and it's uh, heating up the air in the middle of the building. And at the same time, they are speeding up the used air out uh, for, for, from the ventilation. And this is the winter. In the winter, they are uh, using also the roofs for uh, as a sun collector, but more for heating up uh, the uh, indoor climate. And this is the termite and the zebra technology inspired by Günther Pauli. So it's simple. It's very simple if you put all these things and these ideas together. This is a, an old building in the southern part of Sweden. Toyota had a very old building in the southern part of Sweden. And we have been designing the converting of the building with low energy need, lantern skylights, and all these equipment that I mentioned earlier. This is the, how it looks like when it's finished. And uh, this is uh, the existing building, just to give you some figures. Existing building uh, has a need of uh, energy per square meter, 250. Uh, kilowatt hours uh, uh, per square meter. This is what we can achieve. One fifth of the energy need for an old building. And this is the annual cost for the heating. Nowadays it costs, oh, no. Ah, it costs more than one million Swedish krona, but we can go down to one fifth of it. And this is the re reduction of the annual emissions from the building. And as you can see, we can 
go down very, very down, long, down, no, no, down. Yeah, and my last example is from Bhutan. When in March, Günther and I, we went to Bhutan and we were invited to contribute to the design of uh, some information centers in Bhutan. At the same time, we met a lot of very, very interesting people. And this is a beautiful country and uh, the beautiful country of gross national happiness. And you will hear more about that. But I'm, I think these buildings, the traditional buildings, they are so beautiful. Uh, I, you can't add anything. That, that's the final solution for a building. And uh, the advice we gave for Bhutan was to upgrade the old houses with better insulation, with separating toilets, continue to use local materials like the wood and clay, uh, use the grey water for irrigation, and uh, use a portable chainsaw sawmill to produce the, the lumber, and uh, uh, introduce new wood stoves for heating and solar cooking. And this is also together with all the ideas Günther had contributed to for Bhutan. But this is more for the buildings. And for the buildings in city, it's a need of earthquake safe buildings and with a technology based on wooden beams. The split walk wastewater treatment in the cities, termite ventilation, roofing material uh, uh, of corrugated bamboo board, stormwater harvesting, and what we call the holy energy, uh, where we can use the wind, as we can see from the, the prayer flags. They're always uh, everywhere in, in the country, and they are placed on places where it's always wind. And if you convert it and use it as prayer flags, and all the same producing energy, very, very interesting for the future. So, the last part of my presentation. This is uh, how we can use it. So the idea behind eco-cycle design is that the sun energy gives us the presumption for eco-cycle design. And the uh, sun energy is the only thing that comes continuously to the, to the globe. All what we have on the globe is once given, and this is the capital. And the sun energy is the interest rate. And uh, use the interest rate, then you can connect all these things to uh, uh, system design. So when we are carrying out uh, making an eco-cycle design project, we uh, think in, th in three phases. The phase one is to start with a vision or a clear business idea and do it together with the client. You must see for your inner eye what you really want. Make the location of the project, establish a project management, and educate all those who are involved in the project. The second phase is the program work. Uh, this is a description of the project, the social, ecological, technical, economical, ideal vision for the project. And we are using a special checklist uh, for the environmental assessment. And then we need information about the site, uh, information about buildings on the site, description of all rooms, and this is the final program. And then we can start to design the building. Most of the architects start when they get a new job the same day with a big pencil making the first sketches. But we wait until we know what we really can do with the information about the project. We also start very early with energy balance calculation, both for the summer and for the winter. We make cost calculation in early stages, and then we start the design and make it in, in an ordinary way. And this is what we call a construction process with quality control. And this is so important that you have a project manager following the project from the very first idea all the way to the end, to the maintenance phase. Otherwise, you lose knowledge on the way to make the building. So we're studying when we are using eco-cycle design, studying the flow of energy, we try to close the loop. The, the flow of water and close the loop. 
flow of material close the loop. The flow of air in the building and also outside the building. The flow of sound, light, people and so on. When we try to diminish the waste, I think this is so important that if you connect all this thinking together, you can find out that it's uh, very little waste. And there is no waste in nature. When a tree dies in, 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 in the forest, it's the beginning of new life. Waste is only in systems that's not working. So the leading principles for eco-cycle is design, uh, design is reduce, reuse, recycle, renewables, and rethink. And the har hardest to convince people about is uh, rethink, start thinking in another way. And it takes some time. But I show you that it's possible to build sustainable with less footprints, it's energy saving, higher quality, lower yearly cost, stronger trademark for a company, for example, higher market value in the future, and it's profitable. And all of us can be winners when we are working with this uh, concept. So uh, this is the Ultimate eco-cycle adapted house. Uh, it's, uh, I have mentioned it earlier, so I think we can go further. Architects and planners must combine design and system design. This is uh, the important thing about the working in that way. And the economy is not only the investment cost, it's the yearly cost, it's the, the life cycle cost, but also the cost for the society. If you build with not healthy materials, people will be sick and it is cost for the society. And we need more good examples. You can't just talk about what can be done. You must do it. Show people that it's possible. So for example, the investment cost in Green Zone was 17% higher than an ordinary building. But the yearly cost, already the first year, it was 8% lower. And for residential buildings, uh, we know that it's at about 10% more expensive uh, investment cost. But already the first year, it's more than 10% cheaper. And the energy need nowadays in Sweden uh, for our buildings are 25% of the, the accepted new standard for Sweden. And we don't need any district heating, and we don't need any traditional wastewater treatment. And we have also uh, made, uh, Ingrid and I, uh, a time cost calculation. And you can ask yourself, how can you reduce your cost and get more time to, to live? Look upon what your the big expenditures is, are. And uh, this is for the house, for the food, and for the car. And then make a calculation, how many hours uh, are you spending to earn the money? And then you can translate this to in, in, uh, in the cost for, for these three parts of your uh, living uh, costs. And uh, the working time is from you are leaving the building until you are coming back again. This is the working time. Ingrid and I tried this for 20 years now. We have lowered our income per hour uh, with half, 50%. And we are working half time in the company. In half time, we have time for going to Hawaii, to be together with our children and grandchildren and our friends. And uh, it gives us happiness. And I think we need to think in another way. So the final words, which type of society shall we start promoting? Do you want to be a part of the problem or a part of the solution? And uh, cities, buildings, and people, are, they are part, we are part of nature. We are a part of the whole system. So the conclusion, we are all responsible for the global population. And use the sun energy, a never-ending energy source. Take care of our water resources. Don't pollute the air. Use natural, healthy, and local material. Live in ba balance with nature. And I picked up these sentences from Günther. 
We have not inherited the planet from our parents. We have borrowed it from our children. If we only teach our children what we know, then they can only do as bad as we do. And if you want uh, to know more about this, I have written a small book called Green Building and Planning. And uh, you can find also a lot of things on our website. And I also make a presentation for this Energy Wise House. And that's the final slides. Start rethink. We can together build a sustainable world. And thank you for listening. Anders, thank you so much for this most exceptional speech. It's really great that every time I'm with Anders, I am learning and learning again and again. And I can only say that how pleased I am that uh, Mark and the organizers were prepared that Anders was not doing the typical 25 or 35 or 45. But we want to have in this program as much as time as Anders needed to go through his presentation. And I still felt you rushing. You still have held back and explained a bit more because some of these slides, even me having seen them 10 times, I need to see him again and again and again because you are a master. Mm -hmm. Anders is really a master in the system design applied to buildings. I have met the greatest architects of the world. I'm professor at the Faculty of Architecture in Torino and, you know, the Italian designers uh, or the Spanish designers, you know, Renzo Piano, Calatrava, um, you know, Frank Gehry. I've met them all. No one comes close to what Anders can do in practice. No one. And I think that is what we need. Instead of having the big names, we need to have the big, deep thoughts and the practice. And I would say, Anders, you, you are just so exceptional in that. And it's, it's a privilege to work with you and to learn from you. But I think you started a little bit too quick this morning. You were a bit too impatient to get going because while I was still trying to change the world with the Honorable Minister of Bhutan, uh, you already started and we couldn't get to delay it to you. So actually you should have started talking with this around your neck. Or oh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Mm, uh, thank you. It should have been there in the beginning. And somehow uh, it escaped uh, us. Uh, I think the, I'm, I'm so happy because, you know, I've been privileged, as you saw, to visit Anders uh, in his uh, village uh, with my children. But I think it's very important that Anders is focusing on buildings that bring you happiness and health. And I think if I can summarize what Anders stands for is happy and healthy living. And if we would just summarize it as happy and healthy living, the fact that it is eco-cycle adapted, the fact that it's sustainable, the fact that it's energy, it's self-evident. Mm -hmm. But in the end of the day, we could summarize it, it's happy and healthy living. And I think if there is anything that we want to bring our children, is we want to bring them in an environment where it is happy and healthy. And, and the power of your life experience, Anders, is, is really exceptional. But I'm sure that the audience now has many questions. And uh, we would like to create that space. I was only very cross with Mark about one thing. You know what? No. I saw you drinking from a plastic bottle. Yeah. And I said to and I immediately shot back at Mark McGuffey and said, Mark, how did that bottle get there? And he said, I'm not responsible for that. I put the bottle, I, I just put the glasses right there. So I'm sorry. We have a subversive person in this audience uh, who, who's bringing us plastic bottles in here. Yeah. But anyway, um, it was not your fault. And Mark didn't know who's responsible, so we're doing okay. Um, what uh, we would like to do is uh, open up uh, and seeing Mark in there. Mark, how much time do we have uh, for questions and answers? Is it about 20 minutes? Is 20 minutes, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, who, who has a question? Wonderful presentation. Just, mm -hmm. It's amazing to take in, I'm sure. One of the things um, that I see, especially in my own home, is that 
the coolness that you recommend uh, from the termite ventilation. Uh, first of all, I was wondering what temperature it comes out at, and is that worldwide? How deep uh, for volume, uh, or does it have a temperature down there about 70 degrees uh, Fahrenheit? Do you know of the, um, the particulars of uh, how deep you have to go? Uh, I'm not, it's not uh, easy for me to convert uh, Celsius to Fahrenheit. Well, but, I'll take uh, the Celsius and I'll look it up on Google. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, uh, I think uh, if, if you drill a hole down in the ground and take the temperature in the ground, uh, you will find that it's uh, much lower than in the air. And all over the world, uh, uh, it's possible to use this uh, ventilation. For example, in, in uh, uh, Las Gaviotas, where it's, uh, the average temperature is 40 centigrades or? At the 40, 42 centigrades yeah. average a year, 100% yeah. humidity. And this is uh, possible. They have used this termite ventilation, and I was so impressed when I saw it uh, on, on the site. For they have used this ventilation for in the part of the main building, they have a hospital, and they are not allowed to make surgery if the temperature is above 28 centigrades. And they can lower the temperature down under 28 centigrades so they can make the operations. And if they can do it in this hard climate, then it's possible to do it everywhere. And they have no fans. They're using, uh, the, the, they have put these uh, openings to, to, uh, for, for the pipes in uh, facing the main wind direction. And this is an old technology. In the Arab states, 2,000 years ago, they were using this technology. They built towers facing the main uh, direction for the wind. And when the wind starts to blow in the, just at 10 o'clock in the, in the middle of the day, the air goes into the tower and pressed down, uh, down in the ground. And then they dig a big hole in the sand and let the air go up in the middle of the building. And they have used this technology for at, at least 2,000 years. I have seen it in, in documentations. So this is a technology you can use. And for example, in Sweden this winter, it was minus 20 centigrades and the incoming air was plus two. So uh, we save a lot of energy for using this. May, may I just add, uh, Anders, in the case of Colombia, uh, the humidity of the air is 100% nearly all year round. And in the surgeon's room, the humidity cannot be higher than 17%. And over 18 years, they always had the temperature below 17% humidity, naturally, not one pump. And I think this is very important mm -hmm. where the, the, the laws of physics work everywhere around the world. It's only the size of the pipe, the length mm -hmm. of the pipe, yeah. uh, the width of the pipe. That has to change and be adapted to what uh, Anders has been explaining. But our experience in Colombia with this building is amazing. Then you have the experience in Zimbabwe. Uh, the high-risk building. The, 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 a 10-story building with over 400 offices, where all the offices are naturally air-conditioned. No exception. And so I think when you see those cases, um, the beauty of it is that Anders has been mathematically modeling this, so it's not trial and error anymore. It can be very carefully calculated. Unfortunately, most of the architects are not trained in that. And, uh, for example, uh, I didn't mention in the Diva House pro project, we also the, we have a concrete uh, tunnel in for, for the incoming air. And we also made uh, aluminum rods going out in the ground to collect the coolness of the ground. And we bent it a little bit down like this, so the humidity uh, condensate on the uh, rods and dip down and it was sloping down to a place where they can pump it up. So also if you can lower the humidity in the air, you feel uh, much more comfortable in the building. And nowadays we are uh, going from plastic uh, pipings to stainless steel pipings for the building, for they last for 100 years. And, uh, then the next, and this is going to be a building we are 
building uh, this fall. But uh, the next project will be uh, when we are using these uh, uh, stainless steel uh, pipings and connect them with a, a sm small fence. Uh, so it take care of the uh, uh, coolness in the ground better and let it into, to, uh, into the, the piping. So it is, um, we are try trying to make it better. Next question, please. Uh, Anders, first of all, thank you for your great presentation, and I can tell that you are a friend of Gunter over there. I want you to look at his wonderful Aloha shirt, and uh, since you are retired and you've cut your uh, wage by 50%, and my mother is Swedish, so I'm half Swedish, I want to buy you an Aloha shirt if you'll wear it, so uh, here you go. Thank you. But you've got to go thank get you. it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, I very specifically put on this shirt because it's bamboo. You know, this is a bamboo shirt, and I thought it was There's so no important yeah. to have bamboo exposed. And yeah. Next, please. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question, like, uh, what uh, filtering systems are available for uh, recycling water, like, in America, we have uh, medicine drugs like Prozac and birth control. And how is that filtered out so we can use it? Uh, this is a big problem all over the world. And uh, you can't filter it out uh, either in the traditional wastewater treatment plants. You can just wonder what's happening uh, on this island and all over the world where you have uh, uh, this uh, uh, old-fashioned wastewater treatment. But in, uh, in a split box, it's possible if you don't take the fertilizer back to the, 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 uh, to the, the, to the farmer, then you can burn this and use the, the dry powder as energy source. Uh, so this, and then when you burn it on high temperature, you can uh, take care of the medicine chemicals in a better way. May but uh, in the ordinary wastewater treatment plant, you don't do it. May I just add that um, that is one of the reasons why when we looked at the processes that Anders is using by keeping the compost for one year and even a second year, mm. uh, the degradation of the synthetic hormones and the synthetic drugs requires at least uh, a year. You can't break it down under a year. And so that is why, as a, as a safety measure, the way Anders is doing it is secure that the solids, which include uh, the Prozacs and, and, and the birth control pills, that it has to be kept for a year on site for a natural degradation. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it doesn't work. We, we should not forget, they're all synthetically made, so there are no immediate natural uh, biodegradators because it's synthetically made. These molecules are highly complex. Uh, and therefore, it is very difficult to actually break them down. Mm -hmm. But uh, we, we think that one year, we use in Latin America a two-year process, two years, mm -hmm. before you can expose it to anything. We, yeah. And I think it's going to be one of the key reasons why in the future, the sewage systems that are being installed at billions of dollars of cost are going to be considered obsolete before they even are built because it doesn't take care of the huge consumption of synthetic medicines. It can't deal with it. And the problem also with the, the, the old system, I don't know what the situation on the island here, but uh, in Sweden, 30% of the wastewater never end in a wastewater treatment plant. The leakage yeah. for the pipings. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's not leaking, it's going out in the o ocean, yeah. And this is uh, also a big problem, that uh, the cost for renovating and keep these pipings in a good uh, standard is uh, very, very expensive. Another question here? Yeah, <clears throat> I'd like to um, bring this back to Hawaii, but placing it in the context of where you started with the fact that we're going to have to house four billion more people in the, in the next 40 to 50 years. And one of the things that you didn't mention is that that is happening in the context also of peak oil. Mm -hmm. And that 
within that time frame, most experts expect that we're not going to be able to sustain our car culture. Even if we, as we move to electrics, it's not going to be happening fast enough and therefore the world is going to become more dependent on uh, mass transit systems. And therefore, this growth in humanity that we're talking about, these four billion new people moving into cities, are going to have to be living in places that look more like Manhattan than Los Angeles or with respect to your village in Sweden. Um, and Hawaii has adopted, or Oahu has adopted, that logic to a certain extent. I don't know if you've heard about the mass transit project that's moving forward here. Mm -hmm. We're going to be investing $5 billion in building a railway line, a 20-mile railway line. Uh, it's controversial, but one of the philosophies behind it is to create a high-density residential corridor so that we don't continue to build large mm -hmm. suburban developments which is a necessity because in Hawaii in the last 50 years, we have paved over 50% of our best farmland. Um, and there's a contradiction in the process still in Hawaii. Oahu at this very moment is considering approval on two major development projects we, which are of the suburban model. One for 5,000 new houses in a place called Koa Ridge, another for 12,000 houses in a place called Ho'opili. These are two of the best farmland areas left on Oahu. So it doesn't entirely fit in mm -hmm. with the transit model that we're talking about. But the question I wanted to ask is, if we accept that the model of development for the future, for humanity, has got to be high density, has got to look like Manhattan, has got to be built around mass transit, how does your model of building work in that context? Can we make, can we apply some of the lessons that work so beautifully in your single family houses in some of the low rise developments that you were showing us? Can you make that work in high rise developments, in high density areas? I com I'm convinced that it's possible. If you study the flows of the water, you can take care of the, the wastewater locally if you have changed the technology and it's safer and it's better and uh, it's water saving. And uh, the energy can also uh, be handled in a different way, in, uh, also when it's uh, very, very uh, high raised buildings. And uh, also the building material. Uh, that's, uh, all these things, uh, it's possible to do that if you really want to do it. But they are still, there's the rethinking uh, how can we introduce this way of thinking and uh, take a brief and think a little bit about uh, what's possible to do, not rush away to copy the old technologies? Is there anywhere in the world that you know of which is applying an eco-cycle design model to a high-rise residential building? Uh, th there's uh, from Zimbabwe, for example, I think this is a very, very good example. The 10 stored building in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Uh, we, the, there's an example in New York, and uh, I, I think it's possible to, to do it. But you can also make a calculation if you make it high rise and uh, you still have the car problem. Uh, you must leave uh, the society with uh, the transport media with cars. Otherwise, you have the same de density for uh, low uh, building, uh, buildings and high-rise buildings. There, you need a lot of land for the cars. Sometimes more uh, 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 space than f for the family living. So the way I'm thinking about this is mass communication and bikes uh, and, and electric cars that can be available for more people. They, you can take it and go uh, from, from the main line and then go in, in a circle outside like this. We have time for one more question. May I give the privilege to a lady? Hi, Anders, thank you for your presentation, and I, I made it in from the exhibition hall. But 
Um, you gave an example of a solar collector in the Green Zone project that was made of building materials on a south-facing facade. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could describe a little more about the solar collector. It's a corrugated black uh, metal sheet uh, insulated on the back side. And uh, uh, we have a, a glass cover. And then we let the air coming in from one side. And uh, there is a spiral uh, in, in between the, uh, the, the metal sheets. And then we collect it with a fan and use it uh, in the building for the, the, the fresh air intake during the fall and winter and spring. So it's ordinary building material, Corr corrugated uh, uh, metal sheets, black painted. So is it used for thermal, thermal heating? It's yeah, not for thermal it, heating yeah, of the incoming air. Okay, so in our climate where we would be needing cooling all the time, could the same type of, I don't know, heating be applied to, I don't know, use, use yeah. energy in the building in other ways, so this only works in a cold climate. But you can combine it with other technologies and uh, also use the hot air for producing cool air. So this is, there is technologies for that too. So man can make combinations of, of uh, different type of uh, installations. Actually, you have the advantage that when you have uh, the heat exchanger on top of the roof, that you then produce cold air, which will flow down naturally. Yeah. Anders, I think we, we need to talk more to you, but perhaps more informally yeah. during the coffee break. You're welcome. Um, I would like to invite you all to have a warm, warm thank you to Anders for his <laughs> fabulous. And uh, Anna Katrin, has this been streamed over the internet? And we have it recorded on video. We have it recorded on video. So it is the longest public presentation I've heard of Anders. He's never been given time to say everything. <laughs> but I would like to invite all of you. We're going to spread the news. We're going to use the links to... It's going to be on the blueeconomy.de website. 